So let me uh, just quickly say a few words to uh, introduce Professor Manley. Um, I'm distinctly pleased to to be able to welcome him, him here today. Um, Professor Manley, I mean, I, I should say that you're probably the first person that I've had a longer conversation with at any academic conference in my life. The first academic conference that I went to, uh, like 20 years ago, we were both like, you know, graduate students kind of wandering around slightly lost. And I remember we had a really pleasant conversation back then. And then we only met again recently at the, um, uh, the Asley conference in Davis, which you were one of the hosts of and kind of found out that somehow our research had kind of taken parallel paths in a way. I mean, he's, uh, Professor Manerly is uh, like one of the people who are trying to, to link um, sort of the, 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 the scientific discourse about the Anthropocene uh, with literary studies. Um, and of course, that's the subject of his recent book uh, that just came out. Is it this year or last year? This year. Yeah, it's Chicago Press, uh, uh, University of Chicago Press 2021, Climate and the Making of Worlds Toward a Geohistorical Poetics, which kind of tries to, in a sense, link the history of human energy use or the human energy systems with sort of the changing changes in how poetry is written, right? I mean, basically met, try to write sort of a, a geohistory of poetics or well, ge geopoetics, right? Um, and uh, it, as you will no doubt find today, he's, I mean, uh, I, I should say you're in for a treat because, you know, it, uh, Professor Manelik does both really well. He can tell you these, these large, uh, the, sort of the, this, this, uh, this larger story and link that to close readings in a way that I think uh, is that I, I don't think I, I know many scholars do that as well as he does. So I'm I'm really looking forward to this. I should say um, so. He this is the, his most recent book. Um, he also co-edited the um, the book Anthropocene Reading: Literary History and Geological Times, together with uh, Jesse Oakes Taylor, right? Uh, which is a collection of sort of essays. Read, trying to to figure out what does it mean to read literary text in light of the Anthropocene diagnosis. Um, his before that, his first book uh, was the Animal Claim: Sensibility and the Creaturely Voice, uh, which was published also by Chicago Press uh, in 2015. Um, he's been teaching at the University um, at, at University of California Davis since 2014. Um, yeah, so. His, his work uh, sort of covers the, the whole spectrum of, of the environmental humanities or eco-criticism from animal studies to uh, sort of, uh, yeah, to the Anthropocene. Um, and yeah, so I think, whoops, there we go. There's the, the PowerPoint. So yeah, please join me in welcoming uh, Professor Tobias Manerly. Um, and the floor is yours. Wonderful. Thank you, Hannes, and, and thank you, everybody, for being here. As Hannes mentioned, we've actually known each other for about two decades uh, since we were both graduate students interested in eco-criticism and postmodernism uh, a long time ago. So uh, I'm going to be talking today for a little over an hour, uh, and it's a real luxury to have that much time to uh, expand on these ideas. I'll try to keep things interesting. Uh, and throw a bunch of stuff at you and, and, and uh, see what you want to ask me about. Uh, I'll begin by situating the talk. I'm going to give a little bit and, and telling you how I got interested in these topics and what I think of as, as the real big picture uh, for the questions I'm asking here. This talk represents a new direction in my work. It's a first stab at something I've been wanting to think about for a long time, which is reproduction as a socio-ecological relation. How do we connect the most intimate aspects of our lives uh, as, as kin, as sexual beings, to the larger social and ecological implications of our reproductive acts? 
As Hannes mentioned last year, I finished writing a book, uh, Climate in the Making of Worlds. And working on that book, looking squarely at the scale of the climate crisis left me feeling really pessimistic about our planetary futures. And what I've realized is that in the new research I've been doing, I'm really looking for reasons to be optimistic right now. Uh, there's a lot of doom and gloom in the environmental humanities, uh, rightfully. And so, you know, I'm trying to look not necessarily for utopia, but for reasons to be hopeful about the future. One of the things I've been working on is uh, a project focused on rewilding initiatives, uh, ways in which people are organizing their lives and their labor around biodiversity conservation and the repair of damaged landscapes. And the other thing, uh, which I'm sharing today, is this project on reproduction and population. So why is population something to be optimistic about? Well, I, I thought about doing a really big picture uh, for this, this uh, talk and going back to our uh, universal genetic ancestor about 4 billion years ago and, and trying to do the whole history uh, of uh, reproduction, sexuality, uh, early human evolutionary history. Uh, but I'm, I'm going to jump forward really to the beginning of agriculture uh, in this talk. Um, so let's let's look a little bit at the the big picture population wise. Um, here is a chart showing uh, the global uh, population of human beings from the year 1000 uh, to the present with projected population uh, growth over the uh, century to come. Uh, and what you notice here is that very familiar hockey stick shape, which we've seen in so many different charts of planetary indicators, a uh, really clear visualization of what's called the great acceleration phase of the Anthropocene. And in this uh, well-known set of charts that Will Steffen and, and others put together, um, we can see the relation between human activity and earth system changes in the great acceleration. And what we notice is how much human population growth is linked with growing energy use, growing resource use, and consequent transformations of planetary systems. Okay, so this remains a really controversial topic among folks working in the environmental humanities uh, because of the association between population discourse and ecofascism, eugenics discourse, racism. Uh, if we go back to like Paul Ehrlich writing The Population Bomb uh, in the uh, early 70s, uh, there was a lot of kind of uh, racist uh, language and, and racist implications in the way in which population was uh, presented as a problem. Uh, in the humanities, we generally end up focusing on social and political dynamics, distributive asymmetries within society. Uh, and so there's a wariness about talking about population as a kind of totality, right? We want to say that uh, our social and ecological problems are reflections of inequalities within society uh, rather than some sort of larger Malthusian limit that we're running up against. But I think population and the total human population really does matter. Uh, and it does so because of the enormous footprint of agriculture. Agricultural production is responsible for around a quarter of greenhouse gas emissions. It's also the primary cause of uh, global habitat loss. So here we have another really illuminating uh, chart where we can see the total biomass of humans and our uh, domesticated mammals, primarily mammals that we raise for food, compared with this very small ratio of biomass represented by wild mammals. 
as uh, Eileen Christ writes, industrial food production is hands down humanity's most ecologically destructive activity. Okay, so I believe population matters. I think we should find a language to talk about why it matters. Uh, and that's part of what I'm interested in here. Okay, so why be optimistic? Well, population, the rate of population increase is going down. And this is something I think you folks in Taiwan uh, have been reckoning with. It's not happening yet on a planetary scale. We're still adding about 1% uh, population uh, per year, about 80 million people uh, to our 80 billion or uh, 8 billion uh, population, global population. But the rate of growth globally is about half what it was when I was born uh, in the 1970s. And many advanced industrial nations are now much below the replacement rate, right? So the way that demographers talk about this is you need about 2.1 or 2.2 children per uh, woman. Uh, that's how it gets measured. Uh, and, you know, Taiwan uh, is just over one child per, uh, per woman. Uh, it's got the lowest fertility rate in, in, in the world, but South Korea, Singapore, uh, and a number of European countries are, are, are very close. Uh, so even countries that have been long associated with rapid population growth, such as India and Mexico, uh, are approaching uh, a birth rate of around 2.1 children per women, right? So... Uh, an equilibrium in terms of uh, overall population. The long-term modeling suggests that by uh, the end of the century, the global population of humans is going to start to decrease. And this is happening in really variegated ways. As I've mentioned, it's already happening in some countries and other countries. Uh, it's not going to happen until the end of the century. Uh, so, what do we make of this? Well, when the media discuss, uh, here we can see some of the modeling uh, for uh, the coming century. And what's just so striking is, you know, after looking at this chart uh, and just seeing this upward growth uh, to actually start to see it go down, we realize that something really significant is happening something really significant that I think folks working in the humanities and the social sciences have only started to, to reckon with and, and try to understand uh, the causes of and the implications of. Okay, so when the media uh, write about uh, population decline, it's always a problem. It's a demographic time bomb, a demographic winter, a fertility bust, a baby bust right? It's the new catastrophe. It used to be population growth, overpopulation. Now it's population degrowth. Uh, and so why is this such a big problem? Well, because population growth is actually one of the engines of economic growth, right? In part because by generating new people, we're expanding the labor force, uh, we're expanding uh, the population of consumers, uh, and the economy uh, depends on population growth. Yet we know that to avoid ecological catastrophe, uh, we have to shift our economies uh, away from this dependence on growth. And it's starting to happen. Why is it happening? The reasons are really complicated. They're multifaceted and, and they're debated among the social scientists who are working on this topic. Uh, first and foremost, uh, they reflect uh, the education, uh, particularly the education of girls. Uh, they reflect uh, hard-won reproductive rights, availability of contraception, accessibility of abortion. Uh, people are reproducing less partly because of anxieties about uh, economic precarity, partly because of anxieties about the planetary future, 
uh, and those anxieties along with the uh, availability of contraception and uh, the ability to control one's own fertility uh, offer an explanation for uh, population degrowth, population decline. There's also this transformation going on in the ways in which people are defining gender identity, sexuality, and kinship relations. Uh, and I think that's playing a role uh, in population degrowth. Okay, so the talk that I'm going to be sharing today isn't necessarily going to delve too deeply into these hard and important questions about the causes or implications of population decline, but that's kind of the background for this, this talk, and I'm trying to provide uh, some, some historical background for thinking about uh, population growth and population decline. What I'm going to be doing is showing how reproductive compulsion, reproductive crisis, and reproductive choice have shaped a long history of human storytelling. And here I want to invoke Yuval Noah Harari's work. He's the uh, Israeli historian who's very famous for having written the book Sapiens. And his claim that human social life is organized around what he calls fictions, collectively shared but contested stories about the world. Now, for those of us who teach literature, this might be kind of a banal observation, right? That stories matter and stories shape how we think about the world. But I think it's also a good reminder for us that we should be thinking broadly about the work of narrative meaning-making in society, the ways stories and fictions shape our collective and individual decision-making. And as you'll see in this talk, what I'm particularly interested in are the ways in which within the narrative diegesis, within the story world, we watch how these characters themselves are actually telling stories to try to make sense of their own reproductive choices. Okay, so final point I wanna make, and then I'll get into the formal talk. Uh, this is a really new project for me. Uh, over the past year, it's given me an opportunity to read and teach a lot of feminist, queer, and trans scholarship, including this really extraordinary long history of feminist criticism on Milton, Mary Shelley, and Octavia Butler. And the work I'm doing here is really the work of synthesis. I don't want to claim that I'm offering some kind of innovative new paradigm here. Uh, what I want to say is that uh, I'm synthesizing work that's already been done uh, and, and maybe trying to tease out some of the eco-critical or socio-ecological implications of this really influential and important work uh, on uh, uh, queer uh, feminist, in, in queer feminist and trans theory. And I'll also say, there's a lot that I don't know. You know, this is, this is not the kind of research that I've been doing thus far in my career. Uh, so in some ways, I feel like I'm still a neophyte uh, in, in talking about issues of gender, sexuality, uh, and reproduction. Okay, in Against the Grain, his study of early agriculture and the emergence of the state, James C. Scott links the domestication of other species, what he calls command over the reproductive functions of the plants and animals that interest us with intensified social control over human reproduction. While non-sedentary hunter-gatherers typically limit their reproduction deliberately, in his words, through delayed weaning, abortion fashions, and neglect or infanticide, Scott argues that early agricultural societies as they developed in the Near East three to 5,000 years ago sped up the rate of reproduction to generate a growing labor force. This momentous socio-ecological transition, which occurred over several millennia, 
leaves a mark in the Jewish Christian creation story where coercive reproduction and intensified agrarian production are represented initially as a blessing and then as a curse. In Genesis, male and female created in God's image, but for their sexual difference, are immediately after they're created, addressed by the father and directed toward a reproductive end. God blessed them and said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it. The blessing marks a transition as the activity of creation, the generation of new life, shifts from divine speech, God's word, to bodily coupling. And that's why uh, in line 22, the creatures of the sea and the air were similarly blessed. So this is a really familiar passage. Uh, we've all reckoned with it before, but there's two things that are interesting enough that I think that they're worth noting. The first is that the fertility mandate, be fruitful and multiply, is closely linked to dominion. The Hebrew word is rada, this political relation to the earth, to the animals and the plants, the sovereignty that God grants humans over the earth. This is the first political relation and it becomes the model for sovereignty in human communities including the rule of men over women. So here we see how sexual reproductive relations, be fruitful and multiply, are also ecological relations from the very beginning. The second thing that interests me is that multiplicative reproduction requires a command. God's blessing compels the human couple to do what living creatures would seem to do naturally, commands them to fecundity by his word, as John Calvin writes. The voice of the father intervenes here at the beginning to direct male and female to reproduce. The fertility mandate, in other words, implies its potential non-fulfillment, right? Why else would God command these humans to reproduce unless there's some sense of a possibility of sociosexual relations not being organized around population growth, right? So I feel like implied here is the possibility of a society that would be capable of limiting fertility in its institutions of kinship, in its sexual norms, and potentially in the use of plants for contraception and abortion. Indeed, as the historian John Riddle recounts, the male deity of the Hebrew creation myth actually supplanted earlier fertility goddesses, such as Inanna and Demeter, who Riddle suggests might actually better be understood as fertility control goddesses. In his ecological reading of the Bible, Theodore Hebert reminds us that the Genesis creation myth is a composite of two different narratives, beginning with the newer priestly account of cosmogenesis, that's the first chapter, uh, and that includes the fertility mandate that I've been discussing, which is followed by an older story, which he calls the Yahwist's story, the story of Adam and Eve in Eden. The first chapter presents human reproduction as an obligation upon which no limits are placed, in Hebert's words. The second, which closely aligns female fertility and the fertility of the soil, narrates this epochal transition, the, the fall, after which reproduction of offspring and production of crops, in Hebert's words, both require painful labor. Right, uh, so uh, let me go ahead and give you the next slide. Uh, these are a couple of books uh, by Riddle and Hebert that I've been drawing on here that have just really influenced uh, 
uh, my understanding of the ancient world uh, and of this kind of earlier phase of uh, reproductive conflict. Uh, final point I want to make is that it's a reflection of the composite nature of Genesis, the Jewish Christian creation myth that the meaning of the central symbol, the tree of knowledge, remains totally unclear. It's totally opaque. But it's often read, and this is something that Riddle brings out, it's often read to symbolize the knowledge of the role that sex plays in reproduction, right? That that's what the forbidden knowledge is, the knowledge that sex leads to reproduction, which is to say, knowledge of how to control fertility. Okay, so in my talk today, I'm going to be considering the legacy of the Genesis creation myth as it gets retold in three highly canonical literary texts, Milton's Paradise Lost, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, and Octavia Butler's Xenogenesis trilogy, which was published as a single book, Lilith's Brood, in the year 2000. And uh, I've, I've given you the cover of these three works. I taught these three books uh, in a class on reproductive futurism last year uh, and, and used these editions. And I was really struck by the way in which the cover image, and you can particularly see this with Lilith and Eve, it, there's this real echo where they're, they're holding themselves in the same way. They're, they're using their arms to protect themselves. Uh, and, and then actually you notice that the creature is holding his arms in, in a similar way. It's, it's kind of hard to see. Um, and I think just in these cover images, you can actually kind of see this conflict over reproductive agency uh, and this conflict over female reproductive uh, self-control uh, that I'm going to be focused on. Each of these works stages the trauma of compulsory reproduction, the dilemmas of reproductive futurity, and the fraught relation between ancestors and descendants. I'm going to be focusing in particular on these really decisive scenes in which protagonists negotiate difficult reproductive choices with the aid of what we might call fiction making, acts of speculative narration and apostrophic address to their descendants that populate the world to come, that populate the future world, imbuing procreation with species level significance. In these scenes that I'm fixated on, the time horizon of reproductive relations extends out. Oedipal conflicts get amplified into fraught intergenerational relations. So my broad historical argument is that these literary negotiations with reproductive compulsion and choice index a continuous conflict over reproductive agency in the modern period, a conflict that's played out in individual psyches, in intimate sexual relationships, and in the wider socio-political domain. My understanding of this long phase of reproductive crisis has been largely informed by Silvia Federici's revisionary account of primitive accumulation in Caliban and the Witch. As Federici observes, Marx never actually acknowledges that procreation could itself be a terrain of exploitation and also a terrain of resistance. So drawing on Riddle's research on the history of contraception and abortion, Federici argues that the expropriation of common land starting in the 16th century was paralleled by the dispossession of female control over reproduction, primarily in the persecution of witches and midwives, and what she calls the criminalization of women's control over procreation. What was lost in this period were forms of knowledge that had been transmitted from generation to generation, giving women some autonomy with respect to childbirth. 
So even as mercantilist states developed pronatalist social policies, policies to promote population growth, starting in the 16th and 17th centuries, reproductive labor in this period came to be defined as a kind of valueless labor. This form of unwaged work that women undertake that contributes to the creation of value by reproducing the labor force. Reproductive labor comes to be defined as one of nature's free gifts. So Federici describes a process of social enclosure, the reproduction of workers shifting from the open field to the home, from the community to the family, from the public space to the private, this kind of privatization of reproduction. And the hetero reproductive family, or what we call the bourgeois family unit, becomes the central site of kin making a source of mutual aid and attachment, if also violence, amid the insecurity brought about by capitalist restructuring and dispossession. As my three literary texts are going to attest, reproduction is the terrain of intense conflict and crisis across the modern period. This conflict that manifests between the exploitation of reproductive labor and this liberal contractual politics that's also emergent in the period that's organized around uh, individual sexual autonomy and reproductive choice. So on one hand, there's this strong imperative to compel women to reproduce more. On the other hand, there's this emerging liberal political tradition where women are claiming rights over their reproduction and their bodily autonomy. So this is the conflict I'm interested in. This is an unusual literary genealogy that I'm laying out here. A line of descent linking Milton's epic retelling of Genesis, Shelley's Gothic family romance, and Butler's Afro-futurist feminist science fiction. But the parallels that I've already drawn between Scott's account of the Neolithic Revolution Federici's account of early modern primitive accumulation and the reproductive crises of our, of our Anthropocene present remind us of the long continuities that underlie reproductive relations. Above all, what Federici calls the survival of sexism within the universe of capitalist relations. Advanced capitalism still relies on biological reproduction, including the often unwaged labor of gestating and caring for children, just as it still relies on agricultural production and what we now call ecosystem services, the free gifts of nature. Ancient creation myths still inform reproductive politics. The fertility mandate in Genesis still shapes the reproductive choices people make. And this is really the underlying premise that shapes my work here. As literary and cultural critics, we're interested in trying to understand what's new about the times that we live in. Artificial intelligence, genetic engineering, algorithmic capitalism, complex global supply chains, the Anthropocene, all of these, these new things in the 21st century. But to reckon with some of our thorniest socio-ecological predicaments and cultural conflicts, we actually have to think about the persistence of certain modes of production and reproduction. We have to think about why certain stories and certain forms of social reproduction keep reproducing themselves so successfully. So as an argument about literary history, this talk reads science fiction, the exemplary literary genre of great acceleration techno-modernity, as itself a kind of revisionary reckoning with the ongoing influence of ancient creation myths. My hope is that in approaching literary history in the long durée, we learn something about 
revisionary retelling uh, that's less legible when we focus on a single text or a single period of literary history. The encompassing term for this kind of approach to literary history, and here I'm inspired by the work of Northrop Fry, is myth. What I'm interested in is, is myth. Myth is a term that scholars in English literary studies generally avoid, in part because the meaning of myth isn't, isn't very clear. We use it in, in contradictory ways today. On one hand, uh, the term myth can mean a false story that people believe to be true, like the myth of the free market, or these ancestral patriarchal monotheistic myths that people still hold on to, right? But myth can mean something else. It can mean what the translator Robert Bringhurst calls an ecology of stories, stories that invite retelling, stories that we keep retelling in order to adapt, in order to revise. So there's this tension in these two meanings of myth. Uh, and that's really what I'm interested in here. Myth is these old stories that we keep uh, telling and retelling and revising, right? Stories that reflect something residual that still has a hold on us, but also our attempts to come up with something new. Of course, as stories get retold, their meaning becomes more and more opaque, more and more difficult to discern. I've already mentioned the tree of knowledge in Genesis, this central symbol that biblical scholars and exegetes don't really understand. They don't really know what the tree of knowledge is supposed to mean. From Walter Benjamin to Frederick Jameson, I've learned to think about this kind of interpretive opacity as allegorical. Allegory uh, or this speaking otherwise within texts is a expression of multiple mimetic layers that are at work. And uh, I'm going to just briefly talk about this problem. It's really kind of the most difficult theoretical problem in this talk. So I just want to lay it out there. But if, if it seems opaque, you know, that's OK. Um, for Jameson, allegory is an expression of historical discontinuity, reflecting the integration within a text of content corresponding with different historical periods and modes of production. Right. And that's what I suggested about Genesis, the fact that there's a two different creation myths stuffed together may be why that text is actually kind of hard to, to fully uh, interpret. In my argument about litera the literary history of reproductive crisis, allegory, these really like dense interpretive cruxes in these texts that I'm gonna pinpoint, may be said to um, index the coexistence of residual symbolic material concerned with sexuality and reproduction and material that's related to emergent modes of production, new political formations, new technologies and scientific advances. Allegory, we might say, is the hideous progeny that's generated in the coupling of these old patriarchal creation stories and feminist science fiction that's concerned with these new emerging technologies. In another sense, though, allegory, which is really the availability of a text to spawn new readings for new readers, allegory is the literary mode that expresses the unpredictability of reproduction itself, the failure of reproduction ever to generate more exactly of the same. In both of these senses, I'm going to suggest allegory allegorizes itself in my three key texts in these inscrutable monstrous figures, Milton's chaos, Shelley's creature, the monster, and Butler's Oankali, these aliens. Okay, Paradise Lost. There's no reproduction in Milton's heaven. Only God creates in heaven. But there is sex, as Raphael blushingly reveals to Adam. The angels have sex, but it's sex without any sort of reproductive purpose. Reproduction begins with the birth of sin from Satan's head. 
And then the first generative coupling, coupling uh, occurs when Satan has sex with his daughter, Sin, as she, as she recounts. Thyself in me, thy perfect image viewing, becamest enamored, and such joy thou tookest with me in secret that my womb conceived a growing burden. The result of this incestuous coupling is the conception and violent birth of death. This odious offspring, who, as sin recounts, breaking violent way tore through my entrails. Death, inflamed with lust, rapes his mother with embraces forcible, engendering a race of monsters who, hourly conceived and hourly born, gnaw at her insides without rest or intermission. The original pattern of heterosexual procreative kinship is incestuous, violent, and disastrous. The scene set at Hell's Gate in Book Two of Paradise Lost ends with a provisional stabilization of identity when Satan addresses his dear daughter and fair son, sin and death. He promises to return them to a world of light, but this vision of heteronormative futurity is strained when sin foresees a time, as she says to Satan, in which she will reign at thy right hand voluptuous as beseems thy daughter and thy darling. Milton's sin, suffering from compulsory reproductive labor and maternal exhaustion, is a vexing figure of abject motherhood overly allegorical and overly embodied, punished not for her sins, for her misdeeds, as Eve will be, but her, for her very birth. She's this very puzzling figure, and critics never quite know what to do with her. But we can speculate that this personified figure expresses something of Milton's experience as a husband of the dangers of gestation and childbirth. Somewhere around one in 40 births in 17th century London led to the death of a mother. And Milton's first wife, Mary Powell, actually died giving birth to their third daughter. One of their sons, uh, their only son, died shortly after. Milton's second wife, Catherine Woodcock, died of complications soon after the birth of her first child. And around the time of Catherine's death, Milton began to write this great poem, Paradise Lost, retelling a creation myth that attempts to justify the pains of childbirth as punishment for female disobedience. So Milton had a lot of experience of reproductive crisis. While sin suffers in hell, God creates the new world. Inexplicably, he relies on the hetero reproductive mode of generation initially established in the coupling of sin and Satan. Milton's God creates not ex nihilo, but ex dio, out of the part of himself from which he chooses to retire, allowing it to become feminine and free. This is what Milton calls chaos, this part of the cosmos that God's retired from. He's withdrawn from. It's the realm of primal elements in their pregnant causes mixed, the dark materials with which God creates new worlds. In the generation of our world, a living world capable of self-perpetuation, the Father's voice actually calls upon feminized nature, the womb of waters and the fertile womb of earth to bring forth self-generating life. Okay, so what's interesting to me, and of course this is in Genesis as well, but Milton really plays it up, is that even when God's creating, we have this uh, sexual mode of reproduction at work in the kind of figurative language of reproduction. The exorbitant reproductivity in nature finds its match in Adam's defining characteristic. Milton's Adam is really horny all the time. 
but we're actually introduced to Adam before he's captivated by his desire for Eve. We actually get to watch his formation as a sexual subject. When he first awakens in Eden, Adam calls upon the earth and he calls out to the animals that he sees to tell him who he is. But before he can figure out how to communicate with the earth and the animals, uh, the father appears and the father grants Adam dominion and he creates Eve. Adam sees Eve and he, he, he views her as the fairest of all God's creations so lovely fair in his words that what seemed fair in the world now seemed mean as adam complains to raphael her beauty's powerful glance is so entrancing that his own reason is diminished okay so we watch this kind of process of psychosexual uh, subject formation where Eve, where Adam's own interests and his sense of relationality get narrowed and he's just completely focused on Eve. Uh, Eve's libidinal energies are also quite exorbitant. As he does with Adam, Milton uses the story of Eve's first awakening to stage the process of sexual subject formation. Got another picture for you. Uh, Eve, when she first awakens, she's alone. She gazes at her own image in a still pool. And whether this desire that she experiences is autosexual or same sexual, we don't really know. It's not clear. But pretty quickly, again, we have the father's voice uh, directing her to get up and go and meet Adam, right? But she goes and meets Adam, she sees Adam, and she turns back because she prefers the reflected image to Adam's form, less winning soft, less amiably mild. The patriarch patriarchal voice, the voice of the father, then tells her to find her fulfillment with Adam. In him thou shalt enjoy. What lures her from the image is finally not desire for Adam, but the divinely given mandate to reproduce. God's promise that she shall bear multitudes like thyself and thence be called mother of human race. Right? So with both Adam and Eve, we actually see this process of sexual subject formation, where they're kind of commanded to desire one another and reproduce together. And they have a lot of sex in Eden, right? Satan actually complains, these two are imparadised in one another's arms, right? They have a lot of sex in Eden, and yet Eve never gets pregnant. As far as we know, she never becomes pregnant in paradise. She fails to fulfill the fertility mandate. She fails to match nature's fertile growth. There's a kind of reproductive crisis in Eden. And scholars have tried to offer uh, interpretations as to what might be going on here. Why doesn't uh, Eve get pregnant uh, in uh, Eden? And this reproductive crisis, this lack of fertility is especially notable because as we learn, reproduction is central to God's plan. What he ultimately wants to do, according to Milton, is repopulate his heavenly kingdom, which has been dispeopled after Satan's rebellion. And all the uh, fallen angels get sent down to hell. And now there's not enough people up in heaven. So God creates the new world uh, with the eventual goal of repopulation, repopulating heaven. For Adam and Eve, the lack of fertility is registered as an economic problem because there's actually a labor shortage in paradise. Eden's trees, Adam observes, require more hands than ours to lop their wanton growth. 
reminding Eve of her duty to generate more hands, more workers. There are too few laborers and there are also too few consumers. Fruit uncropped falls to the ground. So in Eden, procreation is already a matter of what in the 17th century they were beginning to call political arithmetic. This imperative to grow the population while maintaining an equilibrium with production and consumption. In Eden, there's already a reproductive crisis. Okay. So then, of course, Eve eats from the tree of knowledge, tempted by Satan. And after the fall, Adam and Eve have sex again, and it's very lustful, and they feel a great deal of shame afterward. And the sun is sent down to render judgment, the judgment for failing to uh, keep to the prohibition on eating from the tree of knowledge is first death but also this new sexual division of labor. Eve is afflicted with painful childbirth. Thy sorrow I will greatly multiply by thy conception. To thy husband's will thine shall submit. And Adam is cursed to arduous labor in this world of scarcity. Okay, so... After they hear about their punishments, first we follow Adam as he lays on the ground despairing at this new socio-ecological dispensation. And he starts to think about the future, really for the first time, because Adam, until the fall, is is kind of living in the present, uh, thinking a lot about Eve. Suddenly he starts thinking about the future. He thinks about the implication of this punishment for the generations to follow. All that I shall beget is propagated curse. He sees himself from the perspective of his descendants. For what can I increase or multiply but curses on my head? Who of all ages to succeed will curse my head? Ill fare our ancestor impure. And what I find so interesting about this is he starts to think about himself as a bad ancestor. And then he thinks about his relation to his creator. Did I request the maker from my clay to mold me man? And I'm going to come back to that passage in a minute when we get to Frankenstein. Adam's sense of his place in history scales up as he considers the reverberations of the curse growing exponentially following the pattern of multiplicative reproduction from finite to infinite. His address is redirected from the creator again to his descendants. In me, all posterity stands cursed fair patrimony that I must leave ye. Why should all mankind for one man's fault be condemned? Overcome by this infinite responsibility, he curls up in despair on the cold ground. Eve pities him, uh, but he disparages her and he curses the mode of generation, sexuality that actually necessitates woman. Eve, in turn, proposes a plan to remake the future based on a profound choice, a deliberate act of non-reproduction. And I'm going to read the first part of this passage and, and then the last part. And this is really the passage that got me thinking about all of these issues. If care of our descent perplex us most, which must be born to certain woe, devoured by death at last. And then I'm going to skip ahead. In thy power it lies, yet ere conception, to prevent the race unblessed, to being yet unbegot. Childless thou art, childless remain, 
So death shall be deceived his glut and with us too be forced to satisfy his ravenous maw. Like Eve, like Adam, Eve rhetorically animates the unborn only to unmake them to prevent the suffering of future generations by preventing their very existence, she proposes that she and Adam abstain from love's due right, or if that's unrealistic, that they seek death. In Eve's capacity to imagine self-negation, her contempt of life and pleasure, Adam, in his words, recognizes something sublime. Yet Adam rejects Eve's plan to childless remain. Like the narrator and the angel Michael, and unlike Satan, Adam understands the implications of God's curse. Thy seed shall bruise the serpent's head. The role of human reproduction in the father's cosmic revenge fantasy. Eve's speculative fiction of a humanless future must give way to the reproductive futurism of sacred history, Christ's redemptive birth. That's, of course, Eve's seed, the birth of Christ. Revenge, Adam observes, will be lost by death brought on ourselves or childless days resolved as thou proposest. Adam recognizes that convincing Eve to reproduce requires a much bigger story to explain why reproduction matters. And indeed, Adam forbids Eve to speak of non-reproduction. No more be mentioned willful barrenness. So if if non-reproduction is unspeakable, why does Milton, without scriptural precedent, allow Eve to actually propose elective abstinence, propose non-reproduction. Corrine Harrell and Jessica McQueen argue, I think rightly, that Eve's proposal and the discussion between Adam and Eve that follow stages a reproductive choice in line with the poem's Arminian theology. Committing to reproductive futurism after the fall must be an act of conscious free will, requiring a clear alternative. And that's the alternative that Eve spells out here when she proposes that they forgo reproduction. What is it about Eve that allows her to resist the father's injunctions and imagine human non-being a counterplot to providential history? In her own creation story, Eve's libidinal energy, as I mentioned, was first directed at the soft image in the pool, which promised not multitudes, but sympathy and love. She initially did not think about herself as the mother of generations. She thinks deeply. Her first question to Adam is cosmological. She requests to work separately from Adam, which has been read as a choice to withdraw from his incessant conjugal caresses. Throughout Paradise Lost, Eve is establishing this secret life, forms of care that are unrelated to Adam and her role as the mother of generations. And we see this especially in her cultivation of her garden, what she calls her nursery. Two of the herbs that she grows in her garden laurel and myrrh were both known contraceptives in the 17th century. Now, is Milton suggesting that Eve was controlling her own fertility? I don't think so. And that question is unanswerable. But what I'm wanting to suggest is that Eve is this really fascinating character because she, before she acquiesces to her role as the mother of generations, is presented as this kind of witch-like woman who's internalized some of the unruly freedom evident in chaos. Okay, final point about Paradise Lost, and then I'm going to turn to Frankenstein. Eve's fiction of a non-reproductive future shadows the angel Michael's revelation in books 11 and 12 of 
what shall come in future days to thee and to thy offspring? The culminating theme explored in these books is the inadequacy of narrative, historical or prophetic, to mediate the relations among generations, to secure a lineage or make intelligible an inheritance. This is what Adam's really grappling with in these final two books, is that his, gener his, his uh, descendants are going to either see him as a bad ancestor or they're going to forget about him altogether. There's this kind of breakdown of intergenerational relation that he's made to foresee as the angel Michael shows him what's going to happen. Uh, so Michael shows Adam the flood and Adam concludes that no one should be made to contemplate the catastrophes that will afflict future generations. There's this kind of prohibition on like dystopian uh, fiction. Uh, uh, Adam says, uh, oh, visions ill foreseen by my foreknowledge gaining birth abortive to torment me ere their being with thought that they must be. Let no man seek henceforth to be foretold what shall befall him or his children. I just wanna think a bit about this phrase birth abortive. The word abortive can refer to a monstrous birth or a life cut short in 17th century usages. It's the third and final time that the word appears in Paradise Lost. Satan in hell refers to chaos as that abortive gulf, a void profound that threatens utter loss of being. Then as he crosses from chaos into this round world, Satan encounters a wild region, the region of limbo, where eventually all the unaccomplished works of nature's hand, abortive, monstrous, or unkindly mixed, dissolved on earth, will drift hither in the future. So there's this realm of limbo where all the abortive, monstrous creations of nature are going to end up. So basically, Milton's chaos and Milton's nature are, like sin, these personifications of female procreative power, including, I'd say, the power of non-reproduction, the power that Eve contemplates when she contemplates a non-reproductive future. They're really descendants of pre-monotheistic fertility goddesses, embodiments of modes of generation. And we could call these epigenetic, we could call them evolutionary, that are distinct from the father's way of creating, a preformist way of creating. Their unruly presence in Paradise Lost results from Milton's grand compromise. To solve the problem of theodicy for an emergent capitalist society, to reconcile providence and human choice, he had to evoke the potential of reproduction to go awry, generating that which does not simply recreate the image of the progenitor. And that's why we have these strange allegorical figures throughout Paradise Lost who stand for a kind of female procreative power, power over procreation, and even power to limit reproduction. Okay, Frankenstein. When Mary Shelley adopted Adam's plaintive address to the father as the epigraph for Frankenstein, 150 years later, she signaled that her sympathies lie not with the progenitor, but with the offspring. The impossibility of Adam's request of asking to exist before one exists, did I request thee maker from my clay to mold me man, attests to the unequal relation between creator and creature, parent and child. Adam's question reminds God that we do not choose our creaturely existence, 
We do not choose our ancestors. We do not choose our parents. And we do not choose our sex. The epigraph is Shelley's opening gambit in a brilliant reading of Milton's epic, a retelling of a retelling famously reinterpretable or allegorical because of the mimetic instability produced by the various narrators and scenes of reading in Frankenstein. Frankenstein is a secular revision of a patriarchal creation myth, a Gothic tale of Promethean hubris pointedly directed at its first audience, a circle of grandiose male writers, Percy Shelley, Lord Byron, uh, etc. The scientist Victor Frankenstein identifies with God, seeking to generate life without sex or female labor. A new species, he imagines, will bless me as its creator and source. Lab work replaces the labor of sex, gestation, and birth. Scientific invention promises to supplant the hetero reproductive couple as the source of new life. Though it centers on the stories of three men, feminist critics have taught us to read Frankenstein as the autobiography of a woman, a woman's myth-making on the subject of birth, a horror story of maternity, encoding Shelley's experience at the age of 19 of two pregnancies, the first of which resulted in a premature birth and the death of the infant, as well as her experience of postpartum depression and her knowledge that her mother, Mary Wollstonecraft, had died after birthing her. The violent estrangement between Victor and his progeny, the, the monster, may express a forbidden inclination not the familiar satanic Oedipal imperative to supplant the father, but rather maternal ambivalence, or even in Barbara Johnson's words, the mother's rejection of the child or of motherhood itself. In a story in which a parent abandons his offspring, whom he later attempts to kill, and then aborts a fetus, Shelley I'd like to suggest maybe in some way expanding on Eve's radical non-reproductive counterplot. Of course, the central reproductive crisis in Frankenstein reflects not the mode of generation, but the failure of social reproduction, Victor's abandonment of the creature, the absence of parental nurture. Surely part of what fascinated Shelley about Paradise Lost was the way Milton stages the process of psychosexual subject formation in a situation not unlike hers, where there is no mother and the father is stern and distant. Right? That's basically what happens to Adam and Eve in Eden, and that's also what happens to the creature. No mother, just this absent father. Like Eve, the creature studies his visage in a still pool, something the recent Penguin Classics edition has picked up on in that wonderful cover. But unlike for Eve, no fatherly voice interrupts to give him a purpose. Parentless, he discovers his identity by reading books, secretly borrowed from the DeLacy household. As Maureen McLean Riley observes, he succumbs to the ruse of the humanities, that literature might be the route to his humanization, right? Something we're probably all subject to. As I read, he recalls, I applied much personally to my own feelings and condition. After reading Plutarch's Lives and Goethe's Werther, he reads Paradise Lost, noting the similarities between his situation and those of the epic personages, especially Adam, who is similarly born into solitude though a perfect creature, happy and prosperous. The creature reads Paradise Lost as a romance, and he's partly informed here by his observation of the young couple, Felix and Agatha. 
contrasting his solitude with their domestic affection, he complains, no Eve soothed my sorrows or shared my thoughts. I was alone. I remembered Adam's supplication to his cre creator, but where was mine? Where was my mate? So the marriage plot offers a solution to the problem of identity for the creature, this figure without any relations, without any kinship network. He cites the final passage of Paradise Lost with the world before me, whither should I bend my steps? Recalling Adam and Eve's post-lapsarian exile, right? At the very end of Paradise Lost, as they're kicked out of Eden, dispossessed of their only home, they walk out of paradise hand in hand. And the creature sees this and, and wonders where his, uh, his partner, his mate is. For one dispossessed of home and kin, this image of the heterosexual couple form provides a sense of purpose. Enraged by his involuntary isolation, he demands a mate threatening Frankenstein that if he refuses in the creature's words, echoing Eve, I will glut the maw of death. Okay, so Frankenstein agrees. He agrees to make the uh, male creature a female mate. And Shelley stages a scene of reproductive choice, revisiting Eve's consideration of willful barrenness when Victor on a remote island in the Orkneys, destroys the half-finished female. Like Eve, Victor imagines the potential consequences of his procreative act, the effects of what I was now doing. Procreation, and this is what I've been arguing so far, procreation invites this kind of speculative fiction making. I was now about to form another being of whose dispositions I was alike ignorant. She might be 10,000 times more malignant than her mate. Even if they were to leave Europe and inhabit the deserts of the new world, yet one of the first results of those sympathies for which the demon thirsted would be children, and a race of devils would be propagated upon the earth, who might make the very existence of the species of man a condition precarious and full of terror, had I a right for my own benefit to inflict this curse upon everlasting generations? I shuddered to think that future ages might curse me as their pest, whose selfishness had not hesitated to buy its own peace at the price, perhaps, of the existence of the whole human race. Victor's train of reflection a speculative short story scales up, extending into the far future, encompassing the whole earth and the fate of the human species. Yet in describing the widening implications of his procreative act as a curse upon everlasting generations, Victor echoes the very language that Adam and Eve had used to understand the implications of their procreative choices. Invoking his ancestors, Adam and Eve, he situates himself as an ancestor in relation to everlasting generations. Yet unlike Adam and Eve, he chooses non-reproduction. I, I tore to pieces the thing on which I was engaged. He basically aborts the female. Frankenstein's nightmare is fiction. This little short story that he tells himself as he's trying to figure out whether he should keep producing this female, in which a thirst for children leads to a race of devils propagated on earth, expresses a Malthusian anxiety that multiplicative reproduction intensifies competition over finite resources. Thomas Malthus, of course, in his essay on the principle of population, 1798, had identified reproduction as intrinsically catastrophic human population always in disequilibrium with the means of subsistence. Before Frankenstein aborts the female, the creature had actually narrated his own speculative fiction. And it's very non-Malthusian. That's why I want to draw attention to it. He says that he and the mate 
this female will retire to the vast wilds of South America, live in peace, and they'll enjoy a vegetarian diet. Frankenstein, though, like reads this fiction, the creature's fiction, through a very different lens, through this Malthusian lens, right? Uh, imagining that what they're going to do is reproduce and reproduce and reproduce, and there'll be a conflict over scarce resources between this new species and humans. So there's a, a kind of interpretive difficulty here, and it's what I want to focus on, whether the reader is meant to endorse Frankenstein's choice to abort the female. And I, I think that in some ways this, this uh, interpretive crux is unsolvable, and thus is another expression of what I've been calling the allegorization of reproductive crisis. My students generally say that Frankenstein's choice is the wrong choice. It's just a continuation of his bad parenting, his failure to take care of the creature, right? Some of them have suggested that Shelley is actually critiquing Victor's Malthusian misrecognition of the multiplicative family as biologically inevitable. And they'll ask things like, well, why doesn't he just make the female without any reproductive organs, right? But then others say, well, actually, there's something really valid about Frankenstein's Malthusian dystopian image of the future. Frankenstein is read as an allegory, not of nature's limits, a Malthusian story, but of the unintended consequences of new technologies, new technologies that allow us to exceed nature's limits transforming production and reproduction, right? So in Paradise Lost, the curse had represented divine retribution. In Frankenstein, the curse is a result of experimental science and the emergence of modern chemistry and the new life sciences in the late 18th century. In the Miltonic echo that I'm drawing attention to, we actually can detect what's novel about Frankenstein this awareness of a secular human created future, including the possibility that new technologies of life could bring about human extinction. That's what's so striking about Victor Frankenstein's little thought experiment here, right? He imagines his own creation, a human creation, bringing about human extinction. And that's why people today wanna to read Frankenstein as an allegory of the Anthropocene. Frankenstein justifies his choice to destroy the female in terms of a precautionary principle. He's learned actually to reflect on the long-term consequences of his actions, including what he perceives to be an existential risk to human survival. So what I'm calling allegory here reflects the fact that the creature and, its, and, and the aborted female can embody both a catastrophic potential in biological reproduction and also a catastrophic potential in the technological reconfiguration of natural limits. As Judith Butler, in a really brilliant reading of the novel, observes, these two levels of the allegory express a distinct historical conjuncture in the early 19th century, where, in her words, the destructiveness that runs through every possible kin relation comes to be refracted through the anxiety that new kin relations, as they're being remade by technology, will destroy life. Of course, the embodiment of allegory, a personification equivalent to Milton's sin and chaos, is the creature a monstrous assemblage at once a human being and a new species. By the end of the novel, the creature has come to read Paradise Lost in a new way. Addressing Walton, the polar explorer, who's kind of the main narrator of the novel, the creature first identifies with Satan. He calls himself a, falling, a fallen angel become a malignant devil. But then he 
identifies himself in a way where he's actually demanding sympathy. I, the miserable and the abandoned, am an abortion. He's an abortion in the sense that his life has been cut short, his potential unfulfilled. But he's also the embodiment of what I've been calling a reproductive counterplot, the emancipatory potential for reproduction to go awry. Indeed, for many readers, the creature's non-identity, his status as an aberrant signifier, invites identification by analogy with other categories of wayward being threatened by and threatened to the social order. So the creature gets read as uh, a, an allegory of the proletariat or the colonized subaltern or the escaped African slave or the disabled or the trans person or the animal or the cyborg. The creature is a child and the opposite of a child, vulnerable and dangerous. The creature is queer in the sense defined by Lee Edelman as one who exposes the obliquity of our relation to what we experience in and as social reality, intervening in the reproduction of such a reality by figuring that reality's abortion. Frankenstein is an Anthropocene allegory of the dangers of attempting to control life with technology, but we keep reading Frankenstein also because we recognize a potential in the creature for the transformation of the human. Thus, Susan Stryker, in her extraordinary autocritical reading of the novel, draws a link of non-reproductive potential between Milton's chaos, for her it's not explicitly Milton's chaos, but, but I think it can be read as such, Shelley's creature and her own experience of transsexual embodiment. Though we forgo the privilege of natural and naturalness, she writes, we ally ourselves instead with the chaos and blackness from which nature itself spills forth. Okay, I'm going to just kind of quickly in a minute or two tell you about um, where this all ends up and then just make a, a brief concluding point because I want to have some time to, to chat and answer questions. Um, so the next reading I do here is a reading of Butler's Xenogenesis trilogy, which really returns to some of the kinds of uh, staging of reproductive choice and reproductive compulsion that I've been discussing here. There's a moment at the very beginning of Lilith's brood where Lilith uh, is given uh, a, a, a kind of choice to reproduce with this alien species uh, and produce a new transhuman species. And she has to grapple with the same kind of questions of reproductive futurity that we've watched Victor uh, and Eve grapple with. I'm not going to do that reading here because I just want to make this final point and, and, and then uh, chat. But I, I want to say that I actually see really similar dynamics in a number of different uh, works of science fiction that have come out in the last 20 or 30 years, where we see this kind of epic cosmological scope, but we also see this staging of individual reproductive choice shown to have implications for the entire species. So there's Margaret Atwood's Mad Adam trilogy, and then there's, uh, and please excuse my terrible Mandarin pronunciation, but Liu Sashin's Remembrance of Earth's Past trilogy, uh, where in the very first book, the three, the, the three body problem, Yeo Wenjia, the female astrophysicist, actually provides the coordinates of Earth for this invading alien species. And in the words of the narrator, the fate of the entire human race was now tied to these slender fingers. 
And in that very same scene, she finds out that she's pregnant. So in these big uh, cosmological science fictions, we have in all three of them, an explicit return to the book of Genesis. Okay, so I'm not gonna get into the Lilith Brood reading. I'm just gonna make a final point here. What I think I've been suggesting is that literature in the modern period, this period defined by reproductive crisis, this conflict over reproductive agency can be understood to provide a kind of substitute for the forms of intergenerational knowledge that are so violently unsettled by capitalist and colonial dispossession, right? I think that in traditional societies, there's a lot of ceremonial activity that's dedicated and a lot of storytelling that's dedicated to what we might call intergenerational thinking, where we remember our ancestors and we think about our descendants. And what I see happening in these literary texts is, is, is actually something similar. This attempt to expand our time horizons, to remember our ancestors, to imagine future generations, and to thereby contemplate the large scale implications of reproduction. So maybe when we're reading literary texts, when we're teaching literature to our students, this is part of what we're doing. Partly we're kind of situating ourselves among the generations. Okay, I'll wrap up there uh, and we can have some time for conversation.